you so much. Thank you so much. Good, af good afternoon, everyone. Um, uh, yeah, so my talk is called Let's Web Dev Like It's 1999. Uh, quick show of hands, actually. Who was developing back in 99 or early 2000s? Okay, that's good. That's a good number of people, maybe 30, 40% or so. So I'm gonna be sharing a little bit about my story as how I got into web development and uh, kind of take a walk down memory lane for those of you who were around those at that time or for those of you who weren't, you know, this will be a history lesson for you. So we'll see what it was like um, to develop back then and hopefully learn some things uh, along the way and also appreciate, you know, the things that we have now, even though we like to complain about them. So uh, I tweeted out a link to the slides if you're interested. So on my Twitter account, Ben MVP, if you want to follow along or just know that you have them, uh, they're there for you. And it's kind of clipped at the bottom of the screen, but there's also a bit.ly link that you can uh, follow um, as well. So, but to get started, can I get everyone to stand up? Have everyone to stand up. So we just all ate lunch, right? And it's starting to settle in there, right? And I'm afraid that you will all fall asleep during this talk. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna do 10 squats like this. Okay, all right, and if you're not physically able to do it or don't want to, don't feel like you have to, you can just move your arms if you want to, but we're gonna do it all in unison to get that blood flowing, yeah, so we can feel energized through it, okay? So we'll start at zero, since you know, JavaScript, of course, and we'll count our, our ways up, okay? Ready, let's do it. Zero, yeah, one, two, three, Four, doing great. Five, six, yep, you look as silly as you're doing. Seven, eight, and nine, and that's it. Yeah, all right. Awesome job, everyone. But before you sit down, I want you to fist bump your neighbor and say hello to them. Just say hello. Awesome. Awesome, okay, now we're ready to go. So uh, to formally introduce myself, like I said, my name is Ben Alegbadu. Uh, I'm a Christian, a husband, and a father. This is a picture of my family here uh, at my sister-in-law Naima's, her wedding. So I guess, you can guess who she is. Naima's the one in the wedding dress, obviously. Uh, on the far left is my wife, Rashida. We've been married almost eight years. It'll be eight years in uh, September. And she's holding our youngest daughter, Avery. She'll be two in September as well. And then I'm with my older daughter, Simone, and she's four and a half years old. I am a, a, a um, principal front end engineer at Eventbrite. And I'm on our platform team, and we focus on front end infrastructure as well as our design system. So I do a lot of uh, that type of work. But I'm not here to talk about what I do now. I'm here to talk about me 20 years ago. And it all began uh, with this. So uh, I, in the summer of 1998, when all my friends were out uh, having fun, I was in this summer program. And in the summer program, they taught basic programming language. And it so happened that basic was also on the TI calculator. So I started programming games. I made like bowling and things like that and I made uh, programs, math programs, math apps as well. And in fact, I actually, I used to make like uh, apps like slope calculator and things for algebra in order to check my, my answers for homework or check my answers for tests. So I figured like if I knew how to program it, that means I knew the answers, right? I knew what I was doing. Um, so it wasn't cheating. I mean, it really was cheating, right? <laughs> totally was cheating, but uh, you know, that's how I, I told myself it was okay. Um, so originally, when I had the calculator, there wasn't this, uh, when I was making the games, there wasn't a plug to connect my computer to my calculator. So I used to actually program the apps on the calculator, like by hand, you know, uh, programming this way. And I used to type it up on the computer, print out the app, and then on the way to school, sitting in the back seat of my mom's car, I would just transcode what I had in my paper to the calculator and make apps like that. Uh, when I look back on myself, it's, I'm so embarrassed, but you know, hey, it got me here, so it's good. Exactly. 
So um, I started making apps, and people would ask, like, oh, how do I do it? How do I learn to make um, uh, programs on the TI calculator? So first, what I started doing is I would make tutorials, and I used this, like, the help system and Windows. So I've been using a Mac for like over three years, so I don't remember how, I don't know how Windows works now, but back then, there's actually apps that would um, pop up when you clicked F1 and help, and it was like this whole app, and you could have articles in there, and they would cross-link each other, and you can search. So I built that and had that for uh, tutorials, but it wasn't a great way to distribute um, things. People would have to download it and such. So I realized that actually the web is probably the best way to distribute this type of content. So I created my first website on GeoCities. Yeah. It's beautiful, I know. So great, look at that. Thank you very much. I uh, used GeoCities. Angel Fire was also popular back then. It was between GeoCities and Angel Fire. And uh, I was actually able to go into the Wayback Machine um, to 2000 and actually find this uh, website up so, and take the screenshot of it. So um, it, this is early 2000s basically now. So this is probably like middle of high school or so um, for me when I, when I built the, the website. And it was a full-on application. GeoCities handled the back end and I just did what was the front end then, which was basically HTML and some JavaScript sprinkled around. And I would FTP, or file transfer protocol, files up to their servers, and that's how you get into production. You just uploaded it right there. So I wanted to walk through it. Uh, I definitely made this logo in Microsoft Paint. Uh, and the clip art was actually from PowerPoint. And you can see I tried to put the question mark on the book, but obviously the, 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 I didn't rotate it correctly. The, the perspective is all wrong and all off. And uh, I used Comic Sans, of course, for the lettering and two different colors of Comic Sans. Great. Looks beautiful. And um, of course, I had to have the, the trusty, dusty uh, count. <coughs> Uh, counter on the page, uh, so the counter doesn't work anymore for whatever reason, but everyone had to count how many people had visited uh, the sites back then. And on the far right, I also had, for some reason, decided it was a good idea to display today's date in like one of the most prominent places <laughs> on the page. But the coolest thing, no, the coolest thing is that it still works. Like, <laughs> The JavaScript still works. I did a document.writeline and I just wrote it right in. And like this is the primary reason that JavaScript is backwards compatible. So my website can work 20 years later, right? It's, st it's still there. It still displays the date. I'm, I'm amazed by it. And uh, this text here, this you know, slew of text in the, in the page uh, here, I don't know if you can read it, but I suggest, I recommend that anybody viewing this page view it in America Online, AOL. That's the best browser to view it in. And you know, maybe it'll look OK in Internet Explorer and Netscape Navigator, maybe. Um, and I also suggest that uh, if you viewing this in an 800 by 600 resolution monitor, and make sure that you make your window big enough so that it's 800 and 600. So it's crazy uh, those days. But you can see it's still responsive. Like the windows, the screen is actually much wider. And, the table layout was able to uh, grow to it. So I'm impressed with myself. I was going to say that, OK? <laughs> what I was able to do as a high schooler back then. And then uh, here on the far right, I have this poll asking, what is your internet connection speed? <laughs> and one of the options is 14 by 4 KBS, PPS. So basically, the speed of our conference Wi-Fi right now. And then, and then lastly, at the bottom, I have this uh, navigation, this uh, navigation here. So it's fixed at the bottom. The rest of the page scrolls, and then that's how you can click around. And when you click, the, the page would, would change above. So uh, this is something that's like way above its time. Looks like it's Flexbox or Grid, but we did it a different way, and I'll explain a little bit more about that. But just for fun. Let's take a look at what Yahoo looked like at the exact same time. This was Yahoo back in the day. Uh, this was also Amazon.com, what it looked like back in the day at the same time. So um, I think my site looked better than both of those, to be honest. 
but it's okay. So let's fast forward two decades to present time. I have a blog, benmvp.com, that I built in Gatsby. It's a React static site generator. And it uses like all the latest uh, technologies uh, in order to be, to be performant and to be fast and optimized and things like that. So static site generation didn't exist back then. You know, basically, I was my own static site generator because I had to make every single one of the pages. But now I can use React and using GraphQL and other technologies, um, CSS and JS, Material UI, Webpack, Babel, all these things I can leverage in order to make sophisticated uh, user interfaces you know, just to build a blog. And I was talking to my friend who uh, just recently graduated from UC Berkeley, uh, this boot camp, coding boot camp that they have. And this, I was reading the syllabus for what they were going to be learning over the 12 weeks. And they have, they're learning all these things, HTML5, CSS3, they would be using Express and React and MySQL and Git and all these different things they were learning just you know, to have the minimum amount of skills to be able to get an entry level um, position. It's kind of crazy you know, where the bar is um, now for what's a minimal, minimally valu viable, uh, the skills that you need in order to build a website now. So, you know, we come to meetups, we come to conferences like this to hear from people, to learn about what we should do, what we need to do in order to build great websites. You know, we have to learn about accessibility or we have to learn about uh, service workers and all these different things in order to make a compelling uh, website. I don't, actually don't think that a modern day website now can be built by a single person. Right? You need multiple people who have experience in different areas in order to, to build a, a great website now. Or you have to rely on a lot of open source uh, technology that has already done it so far. So the bar wasn't always so high. You know, it was really, really low. Like, really low. Like, really low. I don't even think there was a bar back then in order to build websites. So I wanted to take a look at some of the aspects of uh, what it took, what we did back then when we were building um, some websites. So before CSS3 came along and we had uh, Flexbox and we had Grid, we needed a way to lay out our pages, right? And many times we would have navigation that we wanted fixed somewhere and then we wanted the content to change and the navigation to, to stay fixed there. So maybe you would have a, a global header at the top or you would have a navigation that would be on the left or in my case, I thought it was a good idea to have the navigation at the bottom for some reason. So you have the navigation at the bottom and um, have uh, the UI laid out that way. So you may be thinking I'm talking about table layouts because that was the way to do table layouts. Hopefully none of you are doing table layouts now, but I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand so you don't put yourself on the spot. <laughs> uh, but I'm talking about something that predated tables for layouts. I'm talking about um, using frame sets. Yeah, frame sets. Who are, frame sets are even deprecated now, so some people don't, may not even know what a frame set is. But before I even get into how frame sets works, I want to just take, I just want to take in this HTML, right? We're using all caps for our HTML. We decided screaming case was a good idea <laughs> to write our HTML, right? And if you look at some of the properties, look at margin height or frame border, like we don't have quotes around our values, like we just put the value there and the frame tag, it's not self-closing, there's no close to it, we just went on to the next tag and somehow the browser was able to figure it out, you know. It's fun times back then. Uh, so what this code is actually doing, here's a visual of it, so we have a frame at the top and then beneath it we have three frames that are aligned in, in a column. So the frame at the top is fixed, the left uh, frame, number frame number two is fixed on the left, and then frame number four is fixed, and then the content in between uh, flexes to whatever uh, amount is left in the window. So going back to it, to the code, um, each frame pointed to uh, another HTML file that was loaded in inside of it. So in this case, there would be a header.html that would just have the content um, for the header. 
And then there was frame sets where it allowed you to organize different frames together. And they could be organized in rows, vertically, or columns from left to right. And uh, these frame sets could also be nested. So you could have nested frames and fix the top and then have kind of more complicated uh, layouts there. And uh, notice the, the asterisk there inside of the, the calls there. So that's saying that I want 20% on the left, I want 20% on the right, and then the asterisk meant that it flowed um, in between, okay? And we had all this kind of like uh, visual styling everywhere. So here I'm turning off the frame border, uh, for instance, because frames by default had uh, frames had, by default had borders around them. And if you left the borders on, they were resizable. So a user could come in and just completely jack up your website by just dragging stuff all over the place. So you had to turn off frames with this no, no resize uh, attribute. Um, and then lastly, uh, you could add this attribute called name uh, to your frame. So uh, what, was, what name was used for was for the actual content of those frames. So here is the nav.html, the one that's sitting on the left-hand side. So in addition to having the grid light layout, right, we also wanted to have those fixed panes so that uh, you didn't have to reload the whole page. The nav isn't changing, the header isn't changing, the ads on the right aren't changing. So inside of nav.html, the links, like for instance, the about link, for instance, would go to the about page. But we obviously don't want it to load inside of the nav, we want it to load in the middle. So that's what the target attribute would do. The target would actually point to a different window or a different frame. Like now, nowadays, we only use target for blank, right? Underscore blank to open up a new window. But actually, that was the original purpose of target, was to target different frames and, and target different windows. And for some reason in this code, didn't have to actually close the LI, like the browser knew how to um, continue going with the LI, so uh, it was pretty, pretty cool, the type of code that we used to write. I, I, guess it was, I guess it was cool. It was cool to look back on, I guess, as a history uh, lesson. So like I said, HTML5 deprecated frame sets, so you actually can't use these anymore. They still work, but they're, they're deprecated. So if you looked at this code, and if you're familiar with CSS, like modern CSS, you may be thinking, oh, that's just like how CSS uh, grid works. And this is basically the code rewritten in modern uh, HTML and modern uh, CSS using CSS grid. So um, there's all the CSS on the right that helps align things and fix things, but it actually lays it out the exact same way. The only difference and the benefit with this is that the main uh, tag, which is used for the main content, is now actually above the navigation, the left navigation. And because of CSS grid, allows us to reorder things visually, even though the content and the markup is one way, uh, is great for SEO, because the content in the main is, is more important. But CSS grid is way too modern for us, okay? So let's go back two decades again and talk about another thing that we had challenges with in the um, early 2000s, 1999. So here is the NEJS calendar that I took and uh, laid out this way. And all we wanna do is take the descriptions and indent them 40 pixels inside from the header. Like that's the objective of what we're trying to do. So naturally, we know CSS, most of us know CSS, probably, and we would uh, use uh, a selector and margin left to just indent it 40 pixels, and, then, and bam, we're done, right? Simple enough, or maybe you will uh, over-engineer it and use bootstrap grid and all that stuff to solve it, but in the end, in the end, we're using CSS, right? But what happens if CSS doesn't exist yet? Or there's a time where it did exist, but you couldn't rely on every browser to support CSS. Like, what do you do then? Like, what's the solve that you're gonna have? And I hear people like whispering it. I hear you whispering it. Yeah, not tables, no. We would use a one by one GIF called the Spacer GIF. Yeah. Who remembers the Spacer GIF? Yes, yes. That was, that was 
pretty impressive technology that the spacer gift. And yeah, I'm calling it GIF, not GIF. It's, I say GIF, okay? So anyway, it was one by one GIF, or it's spacer GIF, or transparent that GIF, and it was this just one pixel by one pixel transparent GIF. So you could just see completely through it, but you could size it to whatever size you wanted. So if you want to indent something 40 pixels, you add a spacer GIF right there in the markup, and you just set the width of it to 40 pixels, and bam, it's indented 40 pixels. Or if you want something 40 pixels down, you would set the height of it to 40 pixels. And if you wanted to go left and right, then you would do both width and height of the image. And you just you know, throw these spacer GIFs all over your HTML in order to get our pixel perfect layouts that we wanted, right? So it's all, it's like all of this styling was in the markup in order to accomplish this. And I, I definitely use it all over the place. And you may be thinking, well, you can also solve this thing with non-breaking space entities. Yeah, use that all the time as well. Just throw those in there. I still use those today, to be honest. But, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, those are dependent on the font size, right? So um, you couldn't exactly guarantee that you were going to get uh, 40 pixels uh, with it. But it was still another way to just get that spacing um, that you want, which was great. So. After that, CSS became like a legitimate thing, right? So we had HTML and CSS that we could use at, as our disposal. Super awesome. So no longer, now that we had CSS, we no longer had to style, you know, put colors in the body tag, like style our text and our link and our background right there in the body tag. Didn't have to do that anymore. No longer did we have to use the font tag in order to style our text. Uh, so in order to st set the font face or the color or the size right there in the font tag, the font tag is so old that it's now like obsolete. It's like past deprecated. It's like just doesn't exist. We're trying to pretend like it never ever happened apparently. <laughs> okay. So I used to use the font tag all over the place in my code um, in order to, to style different things. And if you ever used like WYSIWYG editors back in the day and looked at the HTML that they generated, there were font tags like all over the place um, as well. So still at, the, at this time, you know, early 2000s, we were still using tables for layout. And apparently there are some people here who still do, but you know, I won't call you out. Uh, but we, we no longer, now that we had CSS, we no longer had to style the table using all the attributes. So didn't have to set the width or the border color or the border thickness or uh, cell padding, like all those attributes that we had in there. However, what we ended up using CSS the most for was not pulling out the styling from the markup. We actually used CSS the most for screwing with link colors, okay? <laughs> it's like, hey, you know what? <laughs> I can make the default link red. I could turn, take off the underline. I could make it bold. I could make it so that no one knows what is a link and what's not a link. It's like amazing what you can do. And, and back then, the default, uh, a link that would, you had visited was always purple for some reason by default. So we always automatically changed that to be the same as a, a, as a regular link here. So this code, uh, the regular link is red and not underlined, oh, but when you hover over it, oh, all of a sudden the underline shows up. That's amazing, it's interactive, like look how cool this is. It was, it was, it was so much fun and I decided to make the, the hover black instead of a, a blue link. So we were able to create all this dynamic, dynamic interfaces just by uh, using the hover pseudo class and it only really applied to A tags at that time. So. CSS, when it was first uh, created, was originally there really just to pull out our styling from the markup. We didn't have anything fancy. We didn't have CSS transforms. We didn't have uh, border radius, so we didn't have to like cut uh, Photoshop uh, images in order to get rounded corners on things. Uh, we didn't uh, have transitions for animations. Like We had none of those that, back then. It was just uh, to get the styling out of the markup. So, Dealing with links and messing with links is all we could really do at that time. So one more thing. So you know how there's a lot of 
back-end engineers now are always saying how JavaScript is a, a toy language or a play language, and we always get mad and say, no, it's not. You know, we have ES6, we have async functions. Like, it's amazing what you can do in JavaScript. People are building highly concurrent, low latency servers. We've got super sophisticated web applications that use service workers. Like, it's amazing what JavaScript can do. We have a whole conference just around uh, the language. But two decades ago, JavaScript really was a toy language, okay? <laughs> and we did really, really silly things with it. Like, whenever anybody visits my website, I'm gonna say, welcome to my website. <laughs> and, oh, it's not just the first time they come to the website, it's every time they come to my website, right? <laughs> and we would do silly things like put script tags in the head, which we know now slow down the rendering, and of course, I had my document.write line like right in the body to render out the date for some reason. Uh, like unob unobtrusive JavaScript wasn't a thing back then, okay? So instead of having on load and calling this global say hello function, like I really should have a, a JavaScript file that's gonna have an add event listener handler on it and do it that way, attach it to the body. But we didn't have jQuery yet jQuery came like the mid 2000s, late 2000s. So writing uh, JavaScript for all the browsers was actually pretty difficult at that time. So we could only do the simplest things. Like even just to add an event handler, uh, IE had attach event and the standards was add event handler. So you have to deal with those two differences. It was just a nightmare. And debugging in uh, IE was a nightmare too. Like, I'm at, or in the browsers in general. Um, all we had was alert debugging, okay? So the only way you could know what was going on in your app is have an alert and try to uh, see what the values of things were and why you were in certain places. Like we didn't even have console.log because there was no console yet. Even though console.log or console debugging now was considered like subpar, that would be like 100 times better than what we had to do then. And, uh, and don't have like an alert accidentally in a, a for loop or an endless loop and have, keep having an alert and alert after alert after alert. All you could do was just basically like force quit the app because we didn't have that special checkbox that Chrome has now where if you do it again and again, it says, hey, do you really wanna have this alert again? Like we didn't have that. You just kept having the alerts over and over and over and over again. And IE was like a special, special specimen when it came to, <laughs> to errors. So your users, if there was an error on your page, your users would get this pop-up on the page for every single error. And it's like this cryptic message that you, sh like, I'm trying to imagine like my mom trying to understand what's going on with this or your grandparents are like, it was crazy. Do I click yes, do I click no, what does that mean? And things like that. Oh. It was just, uh, development back then was, uh, was just special. <laughs> but then uh, came along like in the mid 2000s, uh, something called Firebug. So uh, you may not have heard of Firebug, but you should be very thankful for Firebug uh, because Firebug completely changed the game in terms of web development. It was this, initially it was an extension to Firefox uh, that allowed you to actually see what was going on, on the, in your CSS, to have a console, to uh, be able to debug your JavaScript. Uh, it's what got me off of IE onto Firefox. And then um, originally, then after that, I, I went to Chrome and never went back. But you know, it was uh, truly revolutionary. I don't think the whole, the whole Web 2.0 with Ajax, I don't think any of that happens without uh, Firebug. Uh, allowing us to debug our applications. So um, in, um, in those days, uh, and, now, and now we have all of this dev tooling you know, to make our lives easier, to make sure we don't ship broken code. Uh, but in the past, all we had was our source code, and then we FTP'd it to the server and hoped nothing broke. And if you had you know, one dangling comma, your whole entire uh, site would be broken um, by it. But now our code goes through so many steps in order before it gets to production. So, you know, first we have Visual Studio Code, VS Code, which I hope all of you are using, but 
you know, that's my plug for it, which is an amazing editor uh, to write your code. And it catches, uh, has IntelliSense and has unused code warnings and has all these extensions. And then you have TypeScript to make sure that you know, your code is solid. You have NPM, uh, which allows you to import all of these packages so you don't have to write all these things yourselves. You have ESLint for linting and Jest for writing tests so your code is robust. Um, but don't write too many tests and only integration, right, Michael? That's what, that's what you said. Uh, and we have prettier, so there's less fights about what your code should look like. And of course, there's Git and GitHub, which are table stakes, uh, so that you can work together with someone else. Like, imagine two people working on a site without Git, like without version control. Like, it existed back then, but only the big companies. So you would just be like stomping on each other working on it. And we have Travis for continuous integration. Uh, which could be kicked off by git commits and can even run tests or deploy automatically and gulp for running build scripts so that your code is optimized and uh, so that uh, you can strip out comments and, and all these kind of things. Netlify for deploying. It's a, a great time now than what we had back then. So I wanted to say one more thing before I finish because running out of time or have run out of time. Um, but a uh, quick show of hand, how, how many people have been in the industry less than two years? Anybody less than two years? Okay, so we have a, a few people in here. Um, so it's great that you're here, right? It's great that you want to learn, because um, early on, these types of conferences didn't exist. And what I found is that most newbies suffer from something called imposter syndrome, where they don't feel like they uh, belong here. And, Sometimes coming to a conference can make that worse. Like there's more things that you have to learn about. There's, I feel even more behind, right? Um, especially if you've gone through a boot camp, like a three month or six month accelerated boot camp, and don't know, feel like you know everything. Furthermore, there's all of these thought leaders that say, hey, you have to learn all of these old things, the old way, the way I learned it first before you can now use all the, the nice stuff. And my suggestion to you all, I want to encourage you and say, hey, don't stress about it. You know, you're not subpar, you're not less than. Everyone has different ways that they learn. And the most important thing is to be able to uh, enjoy what you're doing and build apps and be successful that way, not going through some kind of uh, process that somebody else dictates to you. So even if you just graduated yesterday, um, you can still be an integral part of this community. You can still do great things in this community. I know people who have uh, been around only a year and are doing amazing things. Some people I've mentored, some people I've just run into and didn't even know they went to boot camps until they told me. Like, you can definitely do awesome things. Don't let anybody uh, tell you otherwise, okay? To sum it up, you got this, all right? And so to close out, I just wanted to hope you enjoyed our uh, trip on the Wayback Machine. Um, if you want to ask me any questions or reach out to me, you can hit, find my Twitter, BenMVP, or go to my website, BenMVP.com, or you can email me um, as well. Uh, I wanted to thank the conference organizers for bringing me here and allowing me to share with all of you. And I don't know how many of you know how much uh, effort and work it takes to put on a conference, but it takes a lot of effort from what I've seen being a speaker. So I wanted to take some time to, to thank Nick and the rest of the organizers for putting on this conference. It's been really, really great. Thank you so much. And then lastly, I wanted to thank all of you for uh, listening in. I know it's a single track, so you had no other choice really to listen to me, but I still really, really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Uh -huh.